and Facebook Live. Okay. Well, it's six o'clock, so I just wanted to um, say good evening to everyone who is joining us. And we are recording this chat, and we are also um, on Facebook Live. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature if you are joining us on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, we'll be monitoring your comments and questions on Facebook. So go ahead and post those there, and we'll answer throughout the evening. And we have captioning available as well. So welcome and Chief, I'm going to let you take it from here. All right. Thank you, Jill. So tonight we have two very special guests. Um, as many of you recall, uh, over the past year in 2021, um, uh, City Manager and I, along with City Council, worked very hard on uh, some of the uh, new um, goals that they had. And uh, one of those was the police accountability and uh, police community relations. And in those uh, goals, one of the goals was to increase our training in areas of implicit bias, bias, de-escalation, uh, LGBTQ plus training. Um, so that our officers were just better, you know, more well-rounded. And we've done that. I have a terrific uh, training manager, uh, Rebecca Sotello, who, who goes out and searches all over for training. And uh, she found um, these gentlemen from Gridiron Training, uh, who we have brought into our department to train all of our personnel. Um, and so uh, I'm going to turn it over real quick to uh, Will Duke and uh, Don Jewell to, to kind of tell you a little bit about their background. And then we're going to go in and we're, we're just going to have a discussion on on training tonight. And, and hopefully you'll have some great questions for us that we can answer because I know a lot of people wanna know what training we do, why we do it, why it's important. Um, and the really cool thing about Gridiron is, is uh, their approach to training and their approach to learning. And so uh, Don and Will, let me turn it over to you real quick and uh, tell us about yourselves. Thank you, Chief. Partner, you, you. wanna go? Absolutely. Uh, good evening all. Good evening, uh, Facebook Live and, and uh, Zoom, our audience out there. Uh, again, thank you, Chief, for having us and Jill for proctoring this. Uh, my name is Don Jewell. I'm a co-owner and along with my partner, Will Duke, of Great Iron Training. And I've been uh, in the training field for, this is actually my 20th year as a, as a trainer. I've trained uh, from uh, community college uh, to uh, police academy, uh, in-service training. Uh, my background, my educational background is in adult education. My undergrad is in uh, adult education from Southern Illinois University. <clears throat> and uh, I'm a retired police officer here from Northern California after 25 years. So, partner? Thanks, Don. And so as, as my partner Don mentioned, uh, we are co-owners of Gridiron Training. We have a, a, a whole host of folks on staff that specialize in different types of courses. Um, like my partner, I have a heavy emphasis in public safety training going back oh gosh, almost 30 years now. I'm a retired captain from a sheriff's office here in the Bay Area with uh, about 32 years in the business. And both my my bachelor's degree and my master's degree have a public safety uh, nexus. And so it just gradually uh, became a, a full-time job now, which is, which is great. It's nice to have the ability to get around. And with our, with our webinar courses, we're now able to reach uh, peace officers all over the state of California, which is really exciting. So a horrible, horrible thing the pandemic was, but there were a couple of bright spots that came out of it. And, and Zoom and the use of Zoom and the acceptance of Zoom is certainly one of them. Agreed. Well, thank you for coming. I actually uh, met Will Duke a, a few years ago when he was a captain with that, that sheriff's department. And uh, when I saw him in the department training, you know, they, we, we kind of struck up a conversation. And, you know, one of the things that we that you talked about that day was that, you know, training, training isn't going to necessarily change that much, right? We have, we have to learn certain things. But I think what, what 
the approach you and Don have taken in Gridiron is how to train, how to, how to teach. Uh, as you said, I think earlier, the days of sitting in a classroom looking at a PowerPoint are far behind us. Hmm. Um, so, um, you know, the, the training that you guys have conducted here at our agency, we get a lot of positive feedback because the officers get in there, they're engaged, and they're actually, they actually feel like they're learning, um, not just being fed information. So it, maybe you talk about just the, uh, how training has changed over the years and how you're developing new ways to train and to teach. That's great, partner. You want to you want to start? Sure. Um, well, let's 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 talk about how it's how it's kind of changed over the years. Um, we know that you know a lot of the training that police officers have have gotten it's from a um, pedagogical approach. It's it's a it's pedagogy. It's it's where the teacher is the center of of the information and they disperse that information. And you have officers starting from the academy who go to the academy for six months and they're sitting in a, in, in a chair and, and they're being spoken to for six months. And some of the academies have a little bit where they're involved and then it becomes the scenario portion where they get a little bit more involved in the, their, their learning outcomes and, and, and a little bit more ownership of, of their training. And then they graduate and go into uh, the field and get into in-service training where we were back to more of the same type of training where, um, you know, they're sitting in a classroom, they go to, uh, a, say, a legal update training, and they're sitting in the classroom for eight hours and somebody at a, at a podium is just talking to them or reading off a PowerPoint, and they are, you know, kind of forced to absorb this, this training in a way that really doesn't speak to their learning styles or the learning domains, right? And so uh, we understand that historically, and it's just a, uh, just a smidget of, of the historical type of, of training. And so what my partner and I uh, do, we, we have a completely different philosophy on not what we do, and this is a gridiron motto, it's not what we do, right? It's how we do it. And we have a complete different philosophy on how we do it. And partner, you wanna talk about how we do it? Yeah, absolutely. So just like good policing chief, uh, good training is relational and it has to be. And so we believe in relational student engagement where we facilitate the training, but the, the, the folks that are there attending the training are actually presenting it. So they do research in small groups, they'll build and create scenarios, they'll create problems and then solutions to how to solve those problems. And it's in doing that that we find that that's where the, the, the anchoring occurs with, and that's really what we have to do. We have to recognize that in lots of learning situations, you only really absorb about 10% of what you received in that particular training session. We're trying to go for 100% of, of what was delivered during the training session. And we know that to do that and to accomplish that, we have the students do it. And so we're really more facilitators than we are instructors. And, uh, and that's the, I think it's not really a secret. It's, but this has been, you know, student-centered learning has been something that we've known about uh, long before Malcolm Knowles and, and Blooms and, you know, some of these other adult learning concepts became kind of the, the mainstream. And so, yeah, how we do our, our classes is really no different, whether it's in person or online, it doesn't change. And, uh, and Post was actually nice enough to ask us to do webinars because they recognize that the demand is such and small training budgets are a reality of today's public safety uh, mission. And so we were able to reach more folks doing the online format at little or no cost, which is kind of our, that's our model. And what is also neat, Chief, is that our training uh, transcend not only to law enforcement, but to other agencies, other, other not agencies, other entities that deal with the same type of thing, right? So bias, we're, we're, you know, everybody has a bias. And so any kind of service industry, any type of industry that people are dealing with one another, our training is, is, um, can be used for that as well. Uh, De-escalation training, right? Uh, my wife particularly works in a, in an ER and they use de-escalating de-escalation all the time. And so it is not just, you know, although we're talking about law enforcement type training, but when, when we're talking to our audience and talking to, you know, folks out there and, and, in Facebook land and, and on zoom, the training that we're talking about, it's, it's multifaceted. 
So just a, just a quick example, Chief, is when, when we're talking about training public safety professionals, we look at it as a triangle. And the triangle has, of course, three sides. So one side of it is the legal portion, uh, the policy, the, what the case law says you know, from the judiciary, what their rulings are on how police have performed and what they think that the police should be doing in these types of situations. All of that is, is on the legal policy type side of it. Another side of that triangle would be tactics. And we know that law enforcement and public safety officials, they've gotten a lot better about their, their tactics over the years. They're doing the job much safer uh, for everybody. And so that's that, that side. But that final piece of that triangle is critical thinking skills. And that's where we really have placed an emphasis on our training. We don't do a lot of training in tactics. We don't do a ton of legal uh, training, although that does enter in a little bit when you're talking about training a training officer and that kind of thing. We'll, we'll examine a little bit of the legal issues with that. Okay. But where we really put all of our emphasis, emphasis rather on is critical thinking skills, slowing things down, asking important questions like, if we do this, if we take this action, what could go wrong? And, and that's really what we think is the main difference in, in training today versus maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think that uh, that's what I'm hearing from, from our staff when you guys are coming in and training is, is, is that it, it, they are having to think um, and they are having to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, one of the things we have seen is a, ch a change in, in the philosophy of how we do our job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and part of that is because of the, the big emphasis and push with de escalation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you said it earlier, not being in a hurry, right? Uh, Incidents shouldn't be measured with uh, with a, a stopwatch or time clock, right? You, you take the time to handle. But and I and I I know that you are doing a lot of the de-escalation training. Uh, can you talk just a little bit about that? Because we've seen a big shift uh, in how in how we do our job and the expectations of the public when we do our job. And you know we're doing we're making a big push for de-escalation training and, and getting our officers to to, to be be ex experts in de-escalation. And bring bring situations down. I understand we're step back. So maybe we talk a little bit about that because I think that's that's one of the most vital trainings we're, we're providing right now. And I would think that that would be a big question that the, the the public would have is how are we training these men and women who are out there doing a tough job in public safety to de-escalate a, a potentially volatile or a very volatile situation? And one thing I can tell you is it's a mindset. And so that, that has to start with the culture and the public safety agency. What is our mindset? What is our, what is our why? Why are we doing this job? And when you get to that very core kind of a concept, you recognize that the protection of life and property is the mission. I mean, that's the job. And so, and that's everybody's life and property to include the suspect that we're trying to take into custody. Yeah. Their safety is paramount as well. And so it's our approach and it's how we're doing it is really what is the, the key there. And that is having a de-escalation mindset for sure. And then letting the, letting the officers and the, the folks that are out there doing the job come up with the solutions on their own in the training is also very invaluable because they're, they're experts at it. They do it all the time. They just don't know what it's called. Yeah. That's really what it is. That's one thing that we, we talk and we recognize immediately and we, when we're talking to our law enforcement professionals is we're doing de-escalation and, and most 99% of our men and women um, in law enforcement profession, they're de-escalating situations day in and day out and they've been doing it for a very long time. And all you have to do, if, if there's any doubt about that, all you have to do is look at the statistics. The number of contacts that American law enforcement have with the public per day. It's in the million, right? Mm -hmm. And then the amount of force used, what are those numbers? And then when you start looking at those numbers and then amount of force used as far as lethal force, what is those numbers? And then and we're talking about, we're not even talking about our percentage. We're talking about a 10th of a percent use, 0 0.001. And so when you start looking at the numbers, you see that what we do, we we're doing right but my partner's correct right they're doing it but do they know what they're doing do they have an understanding what they're doing do they have an understanding of the techniques they're using do they have an understanding of of how to document it after they utilize the de-escalation techniques because all that's important all that's important right absolutely and 
And so gentlemen, I see here, uh, we have a question come in and that is, is this training also to keep our officers safe? Absolutely. Anytime you train an officer how to effectively deal with people who are not being cooperative or who are in crisis um, and how to de-escalate that situation, you're also increasing the officer safety of the officer. And so it's, it's, it's really critically important that we, we point that out. It's not just the, the public safety, it's the officer safety as well. And there's incredible buy-in from, from our folks in, in public safety into using these de-escalation techniques uh, because they recognize it's good for everybody. It's good for everybody's safety, not just the safety of the person who happens to be in crisis at that moment. Yeah, and the other part of de-escalation, Chief, is having the right tools. Having the right tools in order to, to properly de-escalate the situation. And you know, we're not talking about all verbal tools. We're also talking about actual tools that you need to utilize from, from a tactical or, or uh, uh, law enforcement standpoint, right? And so you have, we have, obviously we have verbal, we have nonverbal, we have uh, um, yeah. distract and isolate, we have, we have, there's all kinds of techniques, but the tools that we also need are tools like uh, uh, less lethal tools. Now, there may be questions out there in, in, in our audience, like what are less lethal tools? And those are the tools that we're talking about, our, our uh, electronic weapons. rounds, elect right, electronic weapons, or our 40 millimeter, uh, those type of things. And, and partner, you wanna talk a little bit more about? Yeah, this, this whole less lethal thing is a, a little controversial. Well, what do you mean less lethal? You know, that sounds pretty scary. I mean, anytime you use the word lethal, it's a pretty big word. I remember back when the taser first came out and they, they said, okay, well, this is a, a less than lethal force option. And then they recognized real quick that no matter what you do, whether you're using chemical agent or an impact weapon like a baton hands. Or, or, or your hands, mm -hmm. sometimes things can happen if people are having a medical event or, or whatever and fatalities have occurred. And that's when they realized in the public safety arena, we better not say less than lethal. We're, we're, we're not being specific enough, we'll say less lethal. And so that's really what those force options are. And it's important to have those tools available when you have somebody in an intersection with a machete, we would really like to not have to use lethal force to resolve that, that crisis. And having those tools are amazing options for the increased safety. Yeah, because the less tools we have, uh, folks, is we have less options, right? And if I show up and the only thing I have is, is handcuffs and a sidearm, and we have this person in, the, in, in, in a intersection. Those are my the, besides my my ability to use persuasive uh, verbiage to de-escalate the situation. The only other tools I have is what I have. Right. And so the more tools I have on my belt, or we also call in our toolkit, the more successful of a of a uh, non-violent or a successful resolution to the situation we can have right. the less tools we have, it, it raises the stakes. And we also recognize that one of, the, one of the expectations that has really come about in the last few years now is that the police in some situations can leave. They can actually walk away to defuse a situation from being, you know, why create an exigent situation if you have somebody in crisis in their house, they're barricaded in there and, and us going in, you know, law enforcement officers going in would just make the situation worse. Well, then don't do that. And we, we're, 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 we're really at a great place in, in the public safety arena today where we recognize, okay, in certain situations, maybe we, we offer resources, but at the end of the day, maybe we're gonna leave instead of engaging. Partner, I thought we were required to stay if we were called 911. I thought we were well, that's something that, that the chief and I talked about earlier, and that, and that is that special relationship that, that as a lot of folks think that the police have to do something when the police are called. And that's not always the case. If my brother is under the influence in his garage swinging a baseball bat around, the police don't have to engage with him. They can choose to just not do that, because if, if they do, there might be a use of force. So recognizing that, and that's where the critical thinking skills come in. That's what we're talking about when we're, we're using critical thinking skills. In those types of scenarios, we say, well, you know what? That could actually be worse. If we try to go up and make contact with this individual, we'll just let them do their thing. They're in their garage. They're not threatening anybody. We don't, we don't have to take action. 
Yeah, they're, you know, when you look back at that, you know, a lot of the situations that have occurred and escalated, you know, it's because, because uh, you know, law enforcement, the public had an expectation and law enforcement had an, uh, kind of an expectation that if they were called, they were, they were to solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we grew up in a, in a profession that we were problem solvers. And so, uh, you know, a lot of times we just, we, we put ourselves in, in, in the poor situations because of trying to solve the problem. And, you know, there, there have been a lot of shifts in law enforcement over the last year and a half, two years. Uh, we know that, you know, and, and we've been listening and we've been listening to the public and, and, and trying to figure out, you know, where have we been making the mistakes and where have we gone wrong and how can we get better? Um, and, and I, and, you know, letting officers know that, that, that there is no special relationship. Yeah, we, we are problem solvers, but we can't solve every problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important. You know, you brought up the less lethal. So I'd just like to talk about that real quick for a minute. Uh, right now, um, we are going through a process in Roner Park where we are, we've gone in front of council. Uh, we're bringing a new ordinance and it's in accordance with uh, Assembly Bill 481. Uh, Assembly Bill 481, uh, in short, uh, basically says that law enforcement agencies must develop a policy and have it and develop an ordinance that requires them to go before council on a yearly basis and let council know what less lethal options or what military options they have in their uh, in their department. Um, and so we're in actually in the process of that. So, you know, all who are watching, I would encourage you to, to, to go on our websites and look into it. We have another council meeting coming up uh, in, in next Tuesday to finalize the ordinance. Um, but really it's, it's a transparency thing, right? We have, we, so on ours, we have a 12 gauge shotgun, which only is used for bean bags. We carry no shotgun shells in the cars anymore. And a 40 millimeter uh, launcher that uh, is, a, it's a sponge round, right? But they're, they're less lethal there so that we don't have to use our firearm. We can take a, you know, a, a control situation. However, we've had these, right? We've had, these aren't something that we're asking council, can we go buy or, you know, we've had them, we've had no uses yet, but, but AB 481, says, hey, it, we're gonna have you go and let council know in a public meeting so the public knows. So we're actually trying to, it's interesting we brought that up because we're actually in that process right now. And uh, uh, so whoever's listening, we, we want you to understand what these are. They're not a secret. Uh, I, as when the farmer's markets start, I think we're gonna try to have a, a display out there and let people see them, touch them, understand them so they know what we're talking about when we say military equipment and less lethal. Um, but you're absolutely right. If you know, they say if all you have in your toolbox is a hammer, right? Everything looks like a nail. So uh, you know, you got to expand that toolbox. You got to give uh, options uh, and the ability for the officers that to be able to to, to de-escalate. Uh, another another um, I think not uh, it's not a, another idea that law enforcement has always had, and it was trained in academies. I got the training was. Um, you're always moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. you, you gain ground and you hold ground, mm -hmm. right? And that was the old mentality that we grew up under. Um, and I think it's important to talk about the fact that we're, we're now letting our officers know that it, it is okay to retreat. It's mm -hmm. okay to move backwards, give ground, you know, develop more time to, 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 to talk about a situation and come up with a better plan as opposed to always moving forward and you know that line in the sand type thing right so um it, it you know that i know that's something you guys are training and, and teaching officers but uh, have you guys seen that shift also um in in a lot of because you, you're in a lot of different departments yeah absolutely we we are fortunate enough to be instructors at the regional police academy in pittsburgh as well so we we actually get to work with uh, brand new police recruits that are not officers yet they're just learning they're learning how in a 26 month very intense uh, academy situation and what's what's great to see these 23 24 year olds coming into this profession is they're very coachable they they want to be in the profession for the right reasons their why is very strong they actually want to serve their community and and protect and and keep people safe and, and let people sleep at night. I mean, that's, you know, that's really important that we have that, that perception that it's safe to, you know, to live in our, our communities. And they're there for the right reasons and they're very coachable and they have no trouble with the idea of, you know, backing up and, and giving ground, especially when you have somebody in crisis because they recognize, and this is where my partner mentioned this earlier, I really wanted to go back to this, 
is there has to be increased understanding of what folks are doing. That's really important in, in public safety. Yes, we know we don't go up to the person in the intersection with a machete and, and pull our gun and scream at them to drop the machete. They're in crisis. They're probably not going to do that. So we have to you know, we have to do different things. But we also have to protect the public while we're while we're doing that. So having that understanding and recognizing this person's in crisis, there may be mental illness, ADA issues are, are attendant with that type of thing. How can we resolve this situation with using little or no force whatsoever while keeping the officer safe at the same at the same time? You know, that's that's really what this is about. And it's not all um, it's not all de-escalation and it's not all uh, tactics. A lot of it is just critical thinking. You know, how can we, how can we approach this uh, with the minimal impact to the public and the person that's, you know, that's in crisis and resolve this the best way possible? And these new folks coming into the profession are they they take to it very well. They, they, they recognize that we're not, we're not asking officers today in 2022 to be uh, less safe. That's, that's not the expectation. Uh, the, the expectation is that they think critically, all of them, they all have to be really good critical thinkers. And that's, I think that's the public expectation and that, that's not going to change. I mean, that's, that's what we want our, our first responders to be thinking about. That's a mindset. Should be. The yeah. other thing, Chief, that I think that we, need, we would be remiss with not, not recognizing is uh, uh, having the community understand what it is that we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. And so when we arrive on scene and we realize that the person in the house is, is, they may be threatening suicide, but there's nobody else in the house. There's, there's no one else in danger that, you know, they're, they're in the house and they're stating that they may have a knife, that we don't press that, that we walk away. And so me as a neighbor sitting there watching Roner Park PD roll up to the scene after I call the police because my neighbor's in crisis and then see you spend five, 10, 20 minutes there and then pack up and go away. I may have questions as a community member. I mean, like, what, what, why did I even call the police? But, you know, the lack of understanding um, would create some, some issues. And we have this opportunity in this forum to talk to our community and let them know, you know, why we do what we do. So the training go is, is both ways. And it's kind of funny. A lot of times my partner and I are in the classroom, our, our own webinars, training officers, and that always come up where officers say, you know, it'd be nice if the citizens, you know, could hear this as well. And in this platform, they can. Um, the community here, they can hear and understand, you know, why we walk away and which, my, which you and my partner have stated uh, very well. Uh, but that there's other situations in which that we walk away from to, you know, or, or, or um, how we deescalate you know, situations when we're talking to that person in the intersection with the machete, you know, having the community interject sometimes could be problematic, right? They could be jacking up the situation and not knowing, you know, mm -hmm. what to do. So that is equally is important to, to educate our community. And if we had a, you know, better, maybe a better way of, of getting this message out or, you know, Mike here, you, we have a community online right now. I would be fascinated to have them ask any question that they want to ask right now about training. You know, if you if folks out there, if you have a question about training and what we're talking about, de-escalation, or please ask, please ask. Here's a prime opportunity to get your question answered. So, you know, you bring up a great point because, I mean, I, I the thing I was saying earlier, you know, I, my 14-year-old daughter is so much farther ahead in her critical thinking skills and just how she looks at things and understanding I wasn't 14, right? Our, our, I, our, the generations continue to change. And I think they, they I don't wanna say more intelligent, but uh, their way of thinking, it, the, the world is open up to them. They just have a much different view of the world. And, and they're, they're, they're actually good communicators mm -hmm. um, because they spend all day communicating, right? right. Um, and so they, 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 they feel comfortable communicating. I've seen a change over the last few years of like the, my public safety officers and officers engaging the community. But, you know, the old, the old thing of we're the police and we don't have to tell you anything, it's, it's long gone, mm -hmm. right? We learn, I think we learned that through the media, right? We are in such a better place now because we actually talk to the media and we, mm -hmm. we, we give them information, right? And, 
we have a working relationship as opposed to, I can't comment, you know, no comment. Um, we kept people in the dark. And the scenario you brought up is an excellent scenario where you've got the individual in the house, right? Someone called, said, my, my son is suffering from a, a mental health issue. You know, he's threatening to hurt himself. Uh, he's, he's got a knife. And you get there and you find out everybody's out of the house. He's inside. There's, there's no other danger except to himself. And you, but you've got to go and you got to talk to those neighbors. Say, listen, we're, we've been called. This it's it's controlled. We want you know you have the option. You can stay here, but at least we want you to know that he's in the house and we're gonna we're gonna walk away because there's no crime committed right now. Um, and talk to that neighbor and let them know what's going on. Um, and 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 so even though you're not putting, you're not going to be spending your time in inside the house. You're still you still got to put the time in to make the communication. And right. we, you know, we talked about the fact that officers are, they're always gonna be looked at and evaluated on, on the, when, you know, when there's a use of force or when there's an incident, you know, you're gonna look at that, you're gonna pull apart, make sure policy was followed and procedures were followed, right? Always gonna do that. But the difference now in 2022, 2021 and moving forward is as I, I think we'll put it this morning is now they're going to look at everything you did leading up to that. Mm -hmm. And they're going to question the decisions you made that ultimately may have led to the use of force. So the use of force was good. Mm -hmm. Right. But did, are there things we could have done as we were trying to uh, handle that situation that may have directed it in a different, in a different direction. And so, um, I'm, and that's where I'm seeing you talk about the critical thinking and the development of solutions and slowing down, uh, right? And I mean, we're, we're is it, am I talking the same language here? You guys are the experts. That's really true. If, if you think about one of the biggest differences between policing today and policing 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, if there was a use of force, uh, it, to include a, a lethal use of force, uh, that use of force would be looked at and analyzed and critiqued for months and months after after the event. And if it was deemed to be reasonable, what a re we call it a reasonable officer, right? What would what, what a reasonable officer under similar situations have acted the same way? And if the answer is yes to that, then we call that a good use of force. There is no good use of force. We know that. No, you, you never want to use force if you can get away with it. Um, that's the last resort, right? So that was 20 years ago. Today, what's being challenged and looked at is exactly what you just said, Chief, and that is how'd they get there? How, how did they get there in the first place where they had to use that force? And if the, if the question can be asked, did they need to go in that house? And the answer is not really, then they shouldn't have gone in the house. And they created the need to use the force by doing so. And that's really what we're, we're, we're placing emphasis on. And it's not just with de-escalation though. I mean, it could be anything. We were talking about cultural diversity training here over the last few months and, and the need to be as culturally competent as we can possibly be in the public safety world and why that's important and all of the good things that can come out of that as opposed to not being aware. And then you have that as a barrier to effective communication, which, which it absolutely could be. So it's not just de-escalation. It's in everything that we do. In fact, in the coming months here toward the end of the summer, we're also going to be talking about principal policing at the department. And we're gonna be talking about specifically implicit bias, what that is and procedural justice and what that is and why that's so important. And again, it all gets back to what my partner said. And that is, it's not so much what we do in policing, it's how we do it. That's what's so critically important. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we, uh, and we are problem solvers. I mean, you know, we got into this, we all got into this business, you know, I can't think of a, a, a interview I've sat through when you've got individuals wanting to come into your department of work uh, who when you ask them why they're getting into it haven't answered they want to help people hmm. that's right that's the nature um, and so you know the to to get that paradigm that that pendulum sh shift mm -hmm. off of you have to you know you're the problem solver you know once they've called you you know, they're going to back away and you got to solve the problem. And if you can't solve the problem, you fail, right? I, 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 
switch is, is where we're at right now. We're trying to get that switch to where we understand we have other options. Sorry, Doc. Yeah, Chief, I think it's, I, I think you're right. I think uh, it's, but it's, it's teaching our, our new officers. When I say new officers, I'm talking about in, in today's uh, policing uh, world that we're still solving problems. We just have, and we have more resources to solve mm -hmm. them. You know, we have uh, mental health uh, clinicians. We have, we have, uh, you know, we can pick up uh, the cell phone and call family members. We can call. We can. There are so many more options that we have than that we that we didn't have 25 years ago. That are that's at our fingertips. And the challenge is 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 like we're we've said several times is getting our officers to understand how to slow each call down and utilize work that call prior to getting there yeah. so we're utilizing all of our resources everything so we're checking every, because at the end of the day at the end of the day our mission and value statement says the same thing life and property life is always first and if if we just go by that and we're and we're training to that standard right i want to use every resource available to me to make sure that we know, we understand that there's a sanctity to that life and that we're going to maintain that and uphold that. And so when we're doing our training, we're always talking about, you know, critical thinking, but like my partner said, it's in everything. How do we use our resources in order to, you know, we're, we're talking about principal policing. We'll talk about how do you use your resources? How do you give people a voice? So one of the tenants in, in, principal policing is giving people a voice, you know, let people speak. Sometimes, you know, if, if I'm having a bad day as an officer and, and, and I go approach Mr. Duke and it, there's, it's just not, we're just not hitting it off well. You know, one of the resources we have is having another officer intervene. Another officer step in and says, hey, Don, I got this. Let me talk to Mr. Duke, right? 20 years ago, a while ago, maybe I wouldn't have done that. I'm like, no, no, you know, this is my call. I'll handle it. And it would have gone all bad. But now we, we want to make sure that the officers in this training understand that there are all kinds of resources and utilize every resource in every situation we have. And back to that question that they posted, you know, does, does this training keep our officer safety? At no time do we ever, ever jeopardize our officer safety never jeopardize our officer safety and we train that so absolutely i have i have two questions for you uh, do we have any questions out, out there i don't want to be only i don't want to monopolize this here but um so the the first one i would say is you do train uh up and down the state yes sir. and there's not a there's not an agency i don't think in the state that has all 24 year olds right <laughs> Uh, my agency has has individuals who are going getting close to their 30 their 20 their 15 their 10 we have all kinds of ranges in here when you're when you're when you got a training class and it's it's multi-generational mm -hmm. what are you seeing as far as participation it, it, do you do you see the the veterans you know do they sit back in the back of the room a little bit kind of they're going to evaluate you before they decide whether to jump in, you know, and all the newbies are up in the front or, or are you seeing an acceptance of the new style of learning and techniques working on everything? That's a, that's a, go ahead, partner. Let me throw, let me throw this out there and I'll let you, let you speak to this partner. Um, my, my partner and I have a, a unique way at the beginning of every class. So this is going to what you're talking about with the veterans sitting back. When we first develop our training curriculums and, and meeting and, and confirm with one another and talking, we came up with one thing is we cannot allow our veterans to come in as they used to do with their newspaper <laughs> and in the back of the classroom, sit back and open their newspaper while class starts, right? And so my partner and I came up with, well, what are we going to do different, right? It's not what we do, it's how we do it. So at the beginning of every class, no matter what type of class it is, class start at eight o'clock. At 8.01, our classes are in a scenario. 
they are actively participating in some type of scenario that each person has to participate in. And so that all, that that veteran who would normally sit back and they are up front. And you know what? In the scenario, it requires some veteran officers. We need some leadership in the scenario. And so there go the veteran officer. Now he or she have to lend that that experience. And so uh, that was, I, I'm, it tickled me. I had to throw that out there since you said that because that was something that my partner and I came up with, you know, and we do every class, every class. And so go ahead, partner, go ahead. I was going to say you're giving away all the secrets, but but that's <laughs> that's exactly what it is, Chief. It's involvement, and yeah. and if you involve them, they become stakeholders in the training, and and it doesn't. And the training sells itself. I mean, this is for their safety, for the public's safety. It speaks very directly to their why and why they're peace officers in the very first place. So you know they don't have a heart. You think, oh no, we're doing cultural diversity training today. This is going to be a long day, and they have a blast. They have a, an absolute blast because they were involved at 801 in the morning and and couldn't ever not be involved whether you know whether we're on a, a web webinar based thing or a classroom base there is no difference everybody's at the front of the room in in these classes everybody is at the front of the room so you just don't have a chance to to disengage or to sit back and maybe watch and let the let the newer folks you know do all of the the heavy lifting everybody's involved and that's that has to be that way if it's going to be uh, takeaways that these men and women can use yeah. tomorrow or tonight's shift or you know whenever their next shift is they have to have it's just uh, a very as you know chief it's a it's a tough unforgiving uh, profession it really is it's a difficult job and to be good at it is it comes down to the training and and really if you look at and we we use gridiron because of the sports analogy, right? So what the heck is gridiron? You know, the gridiron is the football field, right? That is what the gridiron is. And to be successful out on that football field, you have to be really good at executing every play. You can't just be hoping that you hit one long pass or, you know, something that happens. You have to consistently execute. And the only teams that are really successful at that are the ones that have the right people and the good training. That's, that's really what it takes is you've got to pick up the right people in the first place. That's in hiring and recruitment. And, and then you have to train people properly. There's plenty of training and we, we recognize that, but there's a difference between a training day. Okay. We trained on that and a real training day where there was takeaways and they actually got to use those techniques and they work and they're successful. And our, our folks are, are, are better at what it is that they're out there doing, which is public safety. looks like we do have a couple of questions. Ah, Thank let me you. See. Thanks, Jill. Um, it says when ten officers on a scene with weapons drawn, why do they all shoot and end up with the person who is shot forty plus times? That's a um, great question. I'm that is a good question. I'm glad it got brought up. Uh, partner, are you okay if, if I take that one? Sure. Okay, uh, and Chief, you know, you know right where I'm going with this. So this is critically important to talk about because it does seem like why would they have to shoot this person with a an axe, for example, who's you know coming at them? Why do they all have to shoot them? Uh, and if ten officers shoot four times, that's forty bullets being fired at this you know at this person. Why what why would they do that? And here's how this works. And we train on this. We actually talk about it, and we 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 do scenarios based on it. If you can designate one officer in that situation with a very violent person with a weapon, if you can designate one officer to be the lethal cover officer, that's what we do. That's what we train them to do. And then everybody else maybe gets assigned less lethal force options like an electronic weapon or 40 millimeter projectile round, or in your case with the, with the shotguns, with the beanbag rounds much better to use the less lethal force options, but we're gonna designate Officer Jewel here, for example, to be the lethal cover if it gets to that. Unfortunately, sometimes it does. And in the cases where this has exactly happened like this, it's because each individual officer is recognizing that a threat to life is imminent, it exists, it's real, and an officer is going to be you know, lethally attacked. And so once they develop that, that mind, set of oh my gosh you know this officer jewel is they're lunging at officer jewel with a big old you know knife or, or whatever it is they have to protect officer jewel's life and they're going to do that by using lethal force in that particular situation 
Well, if there's five of us there and the five of us feel the same way, we're all five going to shoot. I mean, that's just, that has to happen because at the end of the day, we want Officer Jewell to go home and not be stabbed by this lethal you know, situation that he's, he's encountering. So that's why you'll see that happen. It's not, uh, it's not overdue. It's not excessive. It looks, sure looks like it. You know, it, it definitely does. But the reality is, is that you, it's a last resort to use your firearm. And if you have to, it's because somebody's life is in imminent danger. And, and so it's a last resort, you have to. And if there are multiple officers there and they all come to that conclusion, for, for example, somebody's about to, you know, stab Officer Jewel, like in this scenario, then that's why you'll see multiple officers shooting in that, in that situation. It's a great question. And I'm glad it, it came up because it does look like, wow, what is that all about? You know, why, why, why would they, they don't need to do that. Maybe one officer can shoot once or twice, you know, and we'll hope for the best. Yeah, and there, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we, we really uh, try to instill here is, you know, uh, good oversight and supervision, right? And you, you, promote, you promote individuals as sergeants because of their skill set and their experience and their ability to make decisions. And so one of the things, you know, we don't want to see that. I don't, mm-hmm. don't want to see 10 officers shooting, right? Because every time a bullet goes down range, it's dangerous to a lot more people than just one. And so, you know, when you're starting to, when we're starting to train our officers now and in, in not just the tactics, right? When I came up, it was all tactics, right? Post required certain things and that's what you train on. All about tactics. So by broadening our, our idea of what training looks like, um, and, and starting to get our officers to understand it. Hey, as you're going to the call, you should be already developing this plan and run scenarios. And, it, and, and, and when you get there, evaluating things on a different manner than we used to. Mm-hmm. And also having supervisors that are engaged and are on that call to do exactly what you do. They're, they're running the scene. They're not, they're not allowing 10 officers to draw their firearms. They're designating people. They've got people doing jobs We've stepped back, we've moved back, we haven't forced a situation. And so, you know, hope, I, I, I believe we're going to, we're hopefully going to see those situations less and less because of the decisions we're making as we arrive on scene and how we're handling the scene. But you're absolutely right. When things are fast moving and they're fast paced, um, you know, and, and there's an imminent threat happening, officers are going to react in the way they've been trained. Um, and, and yeah, that was. Question. And those, I, I, I was hoping we would start getting some of these questions because I'm, I'm glad that, you know, our public really wants to know. Um, and then how would your training deal with an active shooter? I can't see using any de-escalation techniques in this situation. And, and I will just say that is, a, that is a completely different scenario. That is a, you know, with active shooters, we are going in to stop that, that, that force and that, that situation right there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, you're right, active shooters, that's a completely different, different animal. But I, I don't know if this comes up in your training and you might want to talk about it. Yeah, it absolutely does. You know, we learned, unfortunately, tragically, we learned in public safety with Columbine um, that if you have somebody in a school actively shooting students, we have, we have to go directly to that individual and stop that person. I mean, there's, there's no time to talk to that person. There's no time to, we would love to say, well, even, you know, even in that situation, we'd sure like to see if we could deescalate the situation so we didn't have to use lethal force, but you don't have time. If, if you've got someone actively shooting people, that person has to be stopped immediately. And there's, so that means there's no perimeter set around the school. There's no wave, there's no SWAT, there's no nothing. You go after that individual right away and if there's only two officers to do that then that's what's happening it'll be two officers to do just that um, and it's it's a it's a hor- horrible thing i hope it never happens um, but we we know now that with an active shooter you go right to that individual and stop them immediately that's what you have to do but we do train our officers with once they arrive there if they ever have a time where they say should i use force that's the time where you may have time to de-escalate the situation. Mm-hmm. Because what we do know is these rapid, when there's force to be used, uh, proper force to be used, that force is, is it's just going to happen. It, it, it happens. It just happens almost instantaneously because that's how we train constantly, constantly, constantly. That if, if somebody presents a firearm at you, there's a reaction that the officers are going to take, and it's and hopefully it's an appropriate reaction. Draw their weapon, step offline, engage. Uh, that's not a time to de-escalate. 
So, but if they arrive to this scene and 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 this is an active shooter and they, and they arrive at this classroom and it's just the shooter in an empty classroom, now they can slow it down right. and 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 lock that classroom down. And, and as long as that shooter don't come out or present the weapon towards the officer or, or present some other kind of threat, now they have time to do, use some de-escalation techniques and tactics. But as long as that person is in the in the process of hurting someone else, the officers have to react to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think, you know, you know, what I get when I listen to you is, is one of the things we're trying to, we're trying to train is constantly evaluating and, 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 and finding solutions as you're evaluating as it's going. So if you've got a fast moving situation that's changing, you should be changing your tactic too and your, your approach to that. Don't, don't come up, make the plan. And then I saw them, oh, made the plan. This is what we're going with, right? Uh, you, you can audible, you know, you yeah. want to use the football analogy, Absolutely. right? You to, and then the defense change, you can audible and you can change that decision and how you're going to approach it. So I think that's, you know, another one of your football analogies there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then, um, you know, I, I, there's one other question I do want to get to there, but I had one other, um, uh, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, about the really uh, one of the changes we've seen and how, what you know, uh, either the legislature is starting to legislate a little bit more. It's in our policies, but it's it's really now outspoken in our policies. Is the duty to intercede by other officers, right? Um, the the importance of if you see something or you see something that is wrong or an officer, the duty now you have to intercede, and that I know is something that we're working and training our officers on. Um, you know, is that something you guys are, are, are talking about and then seeing in, in your trainings and, and, and going over? Absolutely, Chief. Um, so, partner, you want to talk briefly about bystander training and what that is and, and how that works for, you know, we know that the law is very clear. If, uh, if my partner Don and I are both officers and I'm making an arrest and while I'm making this lawful arrest, I'm using what my partner believes is excessive force. He has a legal obligation to intervene in in that situation and stop that from occurring. But just telling our officers about this law, you know, and making them aware of the law isn't going to help them to do it. They, they, They need to know how to do it. And everybody has to be on the same page and there has to be a culture, an intervention culture in the organization. And so that's where a bystander training comes in. And, and it's, uh, it's not new. We've been doing this for as long as I can remember. Uh, you, you know, you're in a fight. Uh, you're, the, the suspect's punching you in the face. You're punching him back and you're trying to get him in the handcuffs and you get upset. And, and in the process of doing that, maybe, you know, punches three, four and five that, that you're throwing weren't necessary. Maybe, maybe the first two were necessary, but then after that, it became unnecessary. And it was really incumbent on my partner, Don, to, to stop that. You know, so that, you know, A, the person doesn't get hurt unnecessarily, and B, I don't get in trouble either. So, you know, this intervention thing has been going on for a very long time. It's just now a law. That's the biggest difference. But bystander training. Oh, you've covered it perfectly, partner. In our, in our time we have, I think you covered it perfectly. Uh, it's a training that we're absolutely rolling out here uh, later in the summer. Um, bystander training and the training originated in New Orleans. So New Orleans EPIC uh, training and then Maryland uh, took over uh, the EPIC training and developed it more. And now I think um, uh, George Washington or uh, there's a university in, in, in DC that is actually has, has taken that over now. So it, there has been several, several uh, renditions of how and edits of how this training uh, apps actually presents. Uh, but we will, we're rolling out a bystander training just as my partner talked about. So uh, officers can understand when and how to step in. And most importantly, one thing he said is it has to come, it has to be a, 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 a culture within the agency. It has to be from the, from the chief down. You know, we can't have an officer intervening with another officer and then when the chief looks at it they're like ah you should have just let that one go you know the chief have to be this be the one who who's uh pushing that and and one of the biggest supporter and cheerleaders of the officers who are actually out there doing the doing proper intervention 
right. which will create a, a culture within that agency for officers to want to intervene and wanted to 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 do it and to do it more readily and for officers who are being intervened not to be offended by it or not to be upset by it to recognize that hey you just saved my job or you just mm -hmm. saved me from an ia or you just save me from hurting this this the suspect although you know yeah they just ran you know hit a pedestrian and 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 wrecked a car and took off on foot you just save you know all this from bad from happening by intervening mm -hmm. and that's what that training is about we are uh, i actually had looked into that that uh, bystander training and we were uh, the training coordinator is working to get it together it, uh, it takes work and so when i when i heard you guys are putting it on i was i was thrilled so uh, I guarantee we'll be doing that training. It is a culture here in our department. It's an expectation yes. mm -hmm. uh, that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when I had a, uh, a meeting with the entire department uh, last year, uh, we talked about training. And one of the things that, that came out of it was the officers really, they, they told me, they, we do a lot of training. We, we have a great program. We have a shift that works Monday through Thursday and a shift that works Thursday through Sunday. So every Thursday, half the department is being trained and in the next week the other half is being so our our, our program for training is excellent mm -hmm. um but the officers were talking about the the wanting purposeful training they wanted the training to mean something not just we're not doing it because post says we have to do it we're doing it because it's going to give us more tools on the street and it's not the same old perishable skills the shooting the driving the, right so i i know that we we're our, our staff, at least in this department, are appreciating this new evolution in training and, and the training that's, that's outside the normal parameters of law enforcement, right? The bias training, so we understand, right? And, and the de-escalation training. So uh, there's no doubt that, that, um, that we're seeing a, a complete culture change in, in what our officers want. Um, so one person wrote in asking if they could share, I, uh, May I share your platform with Blue Line Heroes? Um, of course, uh, this is, uh, Jill will be posting this on, it goes on our YouTube channel. And so uh, it's out there. Uh, that's why we have these discussions. We want people to, uh, to join in and, and, and ask their questions. Um, and as people know, you know, Pat, we've had some chats that were somewhat controversial, you know, and ask tough questions, but that's what we want. And then um, is the, Policing culture changing in regard to officers calling out peers who consistently use excessive force. Um, you know, I think it's always been there as, as Will and Don talked about, where, you know, we're giving it a name now, you know, duty to intercede. There's always been that expectation. Um, but I will tell you that law enforcement has come a long way in the last 30, 20, even 10 mm -hmm. years, right? Yeah. Uh, and and there's sure. different expectations than there were back then, and um, like I said, these new generations they're they're a different generation, and uh, they are not afraid to speak up, and mm -hmm. they're not a, they they are they are an accountability generation. They they do have expectations of their peers, and they hold them accountable. Yes, um, so I absolutely uh, believe that we're seeing a, a huge paradigm shift in that manner. Um, because as you guys said, what I think you said earlier, hey, if it happens in Tallahassee, it's gonna affect this agency. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Um, because we're, and we're all one, right? It's law enforcement. It's not Roller Park Department. We're law enforcement. And so I think that officers are understanding, that, hey, we have an obligation to the profession. And also what we do affects everybody. It just doesn't affect me, it affects everybody. And, yeah. and I got into this profession because it's a profession. It's not a job, it's a profession. And I wanna protect that profession. So I, I've, I, I, I mean, I've seen a huge uh, change in, in, in how we look at, um, and how officers look at that. But I know, uh, oh, we're actually pretty close. So I wanna, I wanna first thank you so much uh, for coming for on. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate everybody coming on and listening, uh, and I know you guys are busy, but but thank you. So, any any closing thoughts before we uh, we pop off, and we might have to bring you back again for an encore too. So, well, we'd we'd love to come back. I I know that uh, if if I were asking the question, how are we training our officers today um, to 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 do their job? 
it's it's complicated it's there's multiple layers of what a, a peace officer has to do today in terms of you know investigate accidents de-escalate tense um situations you know handling um you know people with developmental disabilities that have edged weapons I mean, there's so many different things to to the public safety job but what i really want to stress and this can't be overstated is what we're training the officers to to think about and to do is to not get so caught up in the process of, of being a peace officer to understand what the mission is, what, what is the goal? And the goal is public safety. And if, if you keep that why, then what you do is, is greatly impacted by, by your, your mindset and, and the way that you operate. And we, we certainly see that culture at Roner Park. And I'm not just saying that to, to be complimentary. We've been, we spent time with your folks and we understand what their why is and we talk about it. And, and that's really important. Why are you doing what you're doing? Should be something that is thought about all the time. That's critical. Excellent, Don. I would just say that uh, for us, Chief, it's making sure that when we're out there and we're training our officers, that that we leave them with uh, uh, this is police with understanding, mm -hmm. and not just that doesn't mean understanding the crime code or the penal code or the vehicle code, but like my partner said, why are you here? What, you know, when you're talking to a victim or, or even, even the suspect, you know, police with understanding, why, why are we here? What is our mission? What is our values? And if we can get that, you know, the, our officers to just, and I say, if we have, we have our officers buying in and understanding this, and it's continue to push that mission, that, that, that idea is just to continue to police with understanding. Police are our communities with understanding because our communities have a voice and that voice needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, police with understanding, compassion, yes, professionalism, yes. respect. Yes, sir. You know, all, the, all the things that, uh, all the things we want in return, you know, give yeah. that. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of, of the staff here. Uh, I, I, you know, I've worked in several different agencies uh, and, you know, I, this is a great group and, uh, you know, we continue to hire and, now we say, I always say we hire for character, train for skill, right? Um, and so you said it earlier, your recruitment process is so big on, on who you bring in is gonna be, they're gonna reflect you in the, in the community. So uh, again, you, um, I'm seeing uh, comments come in on, on Facebook Live in the chat, thanking you gentlemen uh, for coming on tonight. So it's a lot of positive feedback. Um, Thanks you know, for I'm having sure us. Thank you. That, you know, we were brilliant bringing you on, hopefully, you know, but uh, no, I, I, I look forward Joel to us, uh, please. <laughs> yeah, <kill us. laughs> uh, you know, I, I look forward to, uh, and I know that this actually started because uh, uh, one of John, Sergeant Kemp was in your training class and said, hey, you know, this would be a, a really good um, idea to bring on the chat. So it wasn't, I didn't even know about it. I was, I was told that we're doing this and I'm so glad we did. Um, but yeah, uh, doors always open. You're welcome anytime over here. Come in. You guys are giving the officers some great training. And I look forward to the bystander training. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully at some point we can start developing some, some trainings for our communities. Absolutely. You know, right. that, that's, a, that's a whole new world that, that is out there waiting for someone to, uh, to do, right? Train the community. Um, uh, we just had a Citizens Academy or a Civilian Academy. Good. And they loved it because they got to ask questions. And so, so I know the community really, uh, they want to learn, you know? And uh, so, yeah, an educated, educated police department, educated community on these issues will, will go a long way in, in, in helping us. So absolutely. again, thank you so much, Jill. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Jill. Captioner, always appreciate it. We didn't miss Lucy tonight, but she'll be back. But um, yeah, take care. Thank, right. thank you so much. Everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Anytime.